are live and it is so great to connect with you here. I love the bright yellow color. Like we were saying before, you're in Michigan, I'm in Boulder. And today we usually have sunshine, but today it's about one degree and outside and it is um, very, very, very cold and there's no sunshine. So, and probably the same in Michigan, right? Same in Michigan. We don't see the sun for a few months right now. <laughs> yes, I grew up in Illinois. And so I remember there was like six months of mostly gray. <laughs> so yeah, doom and gloom, I call it doom and gloom season. Yeah, so we'll just intro for the little housekeeping. If you haven't watched our YouTube lives and uh, Facebook lives here, um, you can catch all of them on my YouTube channel, just under Jill Carnahan um, on the YouTube. And if you want more information on free blogs information, you can go to my website, just jillcarnahan.com and drjillhealth.com. But today I want to introduce our guest uh, speaker, uh, Sahar Swadan, who is a um, PharmD, and she obtained her doctor of pharmacology degree and completed three years in biopharmaceutics research fellowship at the University of Michigan. She started her career as a clinical pharmacist for the inpatient head and chronic pain service at Chelsea Community Hospital, and then progressed to director of pharmacy. In 2001, she founded Pharmacy Solutions in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a unique personal and educational specialty pharmacy, and serves as president and CEO. In addition, she's clinical associate professor at the pharmacy uh, of pharmacy at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. She's board certified and advanced fellow in anti-aging and regenerative medicine and internationally known speaker in the areas of pain management and bioidentical hormone replacement. She's also the author of several books, one of which we'll be talking about today. Um, I'm just so delighted to have you because this is a topic that we need more information on for all the people listening today and that's pain management options. And you've just got done writing a book about this. So um, tell us First, what brought you to write the book about this? Well, I always tease, you know, I've written, uh, you know, many, you know, several books with, with my colleagues, book chapters and lots of research and publications. And I always tease, it's like uh, having a child. You always say you do it once and then you go, I'll never do this again. And then you end up doing it again. So with the book, it's the same thing. I really felt like mainly, honestly, it was a humanitarian effort to really help teach a lot of, you know, advanced tools or additional tools, at least in our toolbox for pain management. As we know, the opioid crisis has been really highlighted, you know, especially more recently. Mm -hmm. I really think we had an opioid crisis all along. This was nothing new, but it was very highlighted more recently. And then a lot of doctors were kind of, um, you know, really basically told, okay, we need to get away from opioid prescribing and only use them much more judiciously, which should have always been the case. But also now we really took one of the tools away and we have, we've had tons and tons of patients on these opioids for years and now they were basically naked, if you will. You know, they, they had their opioids taken away. We didn't really um, teach our colleagues and a lot of us don't know some of the additional tools that are available in, into our, you know, functional integrative holistic medicine world, if you will. And I just really wanted to kind of provide you know, our colleagues and clinicians and patients some additional tools to just really look at so they can add to, the, to their armatarium in the treatment of pain management. You know, and pain, you know, as you said, Jill, I mean, basically it's the, it's the number one and number two leading causes of disability worldwide. So back pain is the number one cause of disability worldwide and migraines actually number two. So, you know, I've always worked in this field and in pain management and it's very disabling and, and really in school, all of us learned, you know, what do you use for pain? Well, you use, you know, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, if you will, opioids and, oh, ice and heat too, basically. And that's kind of what we were all taught. And now you kind of, the opioids came off and a lot of those patients and clinicians were really kind of stuck going, well, what else can we do? And this was really the main crux of the book where I brought some of my colleagues from around the globe um, that are really doing some really unique, innovative, additional tools that we can provide our clinicians, you know, with these additional tools that they're already aware of with the medications and physical therapy and other, um, you know, traditional things that they use to kind of just add to their armatarium to give them tools and the patient, honestly, tool help and hope, as I call it. Um, and so that was mainly why it was the kind of, you know, I tease the humanitarian effort here to bring all these clinicians that are very passionate about this. And we put out about collective mind tools and skills yeah. into this book called Advanced Therapeutics and Pain Medicine. 
I am so excited. And of course, we're going to link your uh, link to your book and your website here and then on YouTube and everywhere that we show the video, we'll be sure and share so people can get more information or purchase a copy. Um, but uh, first of all, I'd love to hear, well, first, we met with A4M and, and several other organizations where we teach for, and I just love you bring such a wide um, breadth of knowledge. And because you're pharmacy background, what I've seen for you to someone like me as a clinician is you bring, what are some ideas of how we can approach prescribing and using, uh, whether it's compounding or other things to get some unique things that will help our patients. It's like you give um, our toolbox more tools that we have to use. So pain management, we've got things like fibromyalgia, chronic migraines, we have um, just in general pain from back issues or other things. Um, and again, what we used to have was opioids and uh, we're getting a lot more um, regulations on that and difficulty prescribing. So well, how would you first approach uh, someone who's had chronic pain and make recommendations around some of the tools that they would have? So say someone who had a back injury and, and either had surgery, never fully recovered or still has chronic back pain. Let's just use that as a classic example. How would you approach that patient or re make recommendations to physicians? Yeah. So even if it, you know, obviously it's always a pleasure to lecture with you and we've lectured in a lot of circles together. Uh, but I think, you know, in our world, we'll always, first and foremost, we always look for root cause, right? Because a lot of times pain is the symptom right. and the masquerader of other things that kind of lie underneath. So, you know, I always kind of just like you always, we look for root cause. What could be causing this? Now with chronic pain and pain management, and that's why honestly, you know, 20, I'll age myself now per se, you know, God, probably what, 20, 25 years ago when Joint Commission, you know, started that pain is the fifth vital sign. Remember that? And I was literally flying all over the world or the country to trying to implement pain as the fifth vital sign in the regulations and things like that. And then now we're kind of honestly flying just as fast to kind of unwind that. And I think it's important to know. So, you know, we always, whenever somebody complains of pain, and, and please remember, acute pain management is very different than chronic pain management, right? But that's why it's also very important when a person like injures their back, for example, let's take that as an example. You know, we want to be aggressive and treat that, find the root cause if we can fix the issue, you know, help them because the, the more pain that people have, the easier it is for pain to continue flourish and expand, if you will. You literally almost build like pain highways, as I call it, uh, yeah. because if you keep bombarding that same track, so if you have a highway that's constantly being bombarded and congested, what are you going to do? You're going to go to offshoot and try to get, you know, off the exits or different exits to try to bypass that and really kind of sprout new pain pathways. And that's why, you know, sometimes we have patients that start with back pain and then, oh my God, you know, they got knee pain and oh, all of a sudden now, you know, they have their whole body hurts. It's fibromyalgia. And then, you know, furthermore, or they have migraines or they have a lot of these comorbidities. And because once the pain becomes what we call centrally sensitized in the brain, uh, because remember, you know, pain signals go up the spinal, you know, spinal tracks, if you will, up to the brain and knock on the door and say, hey, you hurt. And pain is not bad, right? The pain is the body's internal warning system of right. telling you, hey, something is wrong. You need to address it. But when it's that constant bombardment of pain, that knocking at the door and we're not addressing it or fixing it, the brain, the brain becomes basically centrally sensitized. Mm -hmm. And then we cause what's called neuroinflammation or kind of fire or inflammation in the brain. And so it's kind of like, that's why when pain people have pain, they tend to get other pain syndromes much more easily. It's kind of like when you have a cup and you keep sticking your hand in vinegar water or salt water right. or something, it's going to keep aggravating it. And that's why it's very important for acute pain to address it fix it yes. and stop it from continuing so we can stop the central sensitization phenomena because then it's much harder to treat. Yeah. So say we have a, you know, acute pain and opiates are perfectly appropriate for these kinds of conditions. It's just that the long-term use there's, you know, other options and things. Would you start with, like in my field, let's start first root cause real quickly. Let's talk just a little bit about that. Of course, 
um, autoimmune inflammation, the gut and dysbiosis and issues there, um, environmental toxicity like mold, infections like Lyme disease, all of these things can create pain pathways and worsening pain. I've seen mold cause neuropathies. I've seen it cause zingers and ice pick pains and severe migraines, headaches related to histamine. Um, I've seen gut issues cause chronic pain and issues there. Um, of course, Lyme co-infections, all these infections can cause pain pathways. So the first thing you probably recommend is having your functional doctor look at other things that are root causes. I know that's what I do. But what about like actual prescribing or alternatives, maybe even natural? Um, let's talk first about prescription options. And then we'll go to like natural substances and things that we might use for pain. Yeah. So, you, you know, and, and just kind of a point on opioids. So this has been well known and this is not, you know, anything new is uh, there is a phenomena called opioid induced hyperalgesia. And what that means is actually the opioids can cause more pain. So then when you have more pain, you use more opioids to try to trump the effect, if you will. And so sometimes patients get stuck, if you yes. will, into the cycle in this opioid induced hyperalgesia, which could be one of the propagating symptoms, you know, for the pain. And, and, and that's why it's also important to see, is that the issue? The other thing in our world, obviously, Jill, as you know, is um, opioids can also, so chronic, not acute. Now, again, we're not talking acute because exactly short-term use for post-surgery, post-dental stuff, post, you know, acute injuries, of course, you can use opioids for that, but it's the longer term. They can also cause endocrine dysfunction, which we know hormones are very uh helpful in modulating pain and inflammation also. So opioids can cause actually hormonal dysregulation, which can also propagate the pain, you know, the pain symptoms mm -hmm. of the syndrome. So as far as, you know, what do we use? So obviously, uh, historically, you know, honestly, what we had, I always called it was band-aids, right? We had band-aid medicine, not necessarily fixing the root cause, but try to help. Yeah. So some of the things that we use besides, you know, the typical anti-inflammatories, right? Like, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, steroidal anti-inflammatories, you know, uh, the acetaminophen and Tylenols of the world and, and those kind of things we've always used. Obviously, it's kind of over-the-counter type mm -hmm. help or over-the-counter. Some of the prescription medications, obviously, you know, people are very familiar with those. We've always used kind of the antidepressants or that class of drugs that was used. The yeah. anti-seizure or anti-epileptics were kind of repurposed, you know, for pain management. Some and of are for each of these classes, because we've got physician listeners that will know those yeah. classes and we've got a lot of patients and laypersons that won't know what you're talking about. So for those classes, let's give examples of each one. Yeah. Just even, so you mentioned like Tylenol, which is um, non-steroidal and then also like um, Advil. Yeah, that's like Advil. Not, yeah. you like that's non-steroidal. The, it's kind of like your yeah. typical Motrin and ibuprofen yep. and Perfect. Anaprox type class, you know, the Tylenol or acetaminophen yep. type group, you know, and that was really kind of mainly over the counter. And then you have a lot of those like icy heat, you know, cooling, warming type, mm -hmm. you know, salves and ointments that patients, you know, would use obviously. Now, some of the prescription medications, so the antidepressants, you know, yeah. people are familiar with those like, okay, the Prozac of the world, yeah. the Paxil, the Cymbaltas or Diloxetine mm -hmm. of the world. So these kind of what they do is, you know, obviously they kind of um, help modulate brain chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. So the goal here is we can modulate maybe and increase your happy hormones, as I call yeah. it, increase serotonin, which kind of is in yeah. So studies that, show, exactly. Exactly, that lower serotonin or lower dopamine not only induce depression, but more pain. So there is a correlation with the neurotransmitters, like you said, that um, lower levels may be, you may be more prone to pain syndromes. Yeah. And so with pain, you know, you have what we call excitation and inhibitory pathways, right? Mm -hmm. So either you got the volume turned way up and our goal is to kind of tone the volume down. So you have these pathways in your basically spinal tracts and brain, literally that they're called excitatory and inhibitory. It's like, the, I amplify the signal or I turn it off. So serotonin, dopamine, it kind of help modulate it and kind of turn it off. Um, and so our goal is to kind of turn the volume down with these drugs and, and increase the inhibition or the calming down of these signals. So some other things that we've used, you know, the anti-epileptic drug class or anti-seizure. So the big one that's probably used for pain, like a lot of people are familiar with is gabapentin yeah. or Lyrica pregabalin, you know, but we've used a lot of the other anti-seizure medications, you know, like the Tegretol type class and, mm -hmm. and Lamictal and things like that, that we use for different pain syndromes and, and Keppra and, um, mm -hmm. 
those kind of medications that are used, you know, sometimes even blood pressure type medications would be yeah. used in pain management and migraines, like the ACE inhibitors, like in you know, examples of lisinopril or candy sartan has some data published in migraine, you know, calcium channel blockers have been used in certain uh, and beta blockers, you know, like uh, verapamil and, you know, atenolol and those kind of drug class can be used in various pain syndrome and migraine syndromes and stuff like that. So that's what it was always, you know, they're definitely for something else, but we've repurposed them to try to help with kind of, and sometimes we've used it with certain pain syndromes, like, um, you know, um, uh, CRPS, which is a specific yes. like neuropathy, probably one of the worst neuropathic, if you will, you know, or neuropathy pain of all kinds of causes, uh, fibromyalgia, which is a really subtype of small mm -hmm. fiber neuropathy. Uh, sometimes we use kind of these like antiarrhythmia type drugs, things that kind of help regulate your blood uh, or your heart conduction or your heart mm -hmm. electrical signals, if you will, kind of to help with these pain signal transmissions that we've used also. So that's what we've always had it really at our fingertips were drugs for different things, but we tried to kind of modulate either the electrical signals, mm -hmm. increase your happy hormones or increase the effect of the calming, um, you know, drugs on your, in, on your calm me down pathways, you know, and, and that's why it's, it's also important to continue to do that, you know, for as much as we always love to use our, uh, you know, integrative functional medicine, you know, always do the lifestyle, find root causes, supplements and vitamins, you know, physical therapy, saunas, and all this good stuff that we will talk about. Um, you know, sometimes we really need these additional still, you know, pharmaceutical and pharmacological tools to kind of get in the brain, if you will, calm down the central sensitization. And that's how we really um, achieve longer lasting in, in true treatment of the cause and not just band-aid. So you did a fantastic, fantastic job of kind of overviewing pharmaceutical, which again, there's such a place for those. Let's move. Um, I want to talk about non either med or herb options, which there's a lot as well. But let's talk quickly about herbal and other options. I've seen such great benefits. Um, and I know like the, off the top of my head, turmeric and curcumin are so powerful anti-inflammatory. I love Boswellia. And personally, that one actually does better for me than turmeric. Um, and then there's combinations of NRF2 uh, modulators and things which are pathways for inflammation. What are some of your top like favorite herbs and combination products? And there's whole CBD, which is a whole nother thing. I would love for you to go through just like you just did some of your favorite kind of anti-inflammatory herbal or other types of things that are natural substances. Yeah. So absolutely. I mean, we always focus on the gut, 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 as I always say. So when in doubt, I always start with the gut, you know, yes. I always say, so definitely, you know, we really need to fix that. So I love probiotics because we know they can help gut, but we know they can also modulate the immune system. And we know a lot of times it's immune dysregulation that also yes. kind of trips the immune system and propagates the pain syndrome. So I love probiotics, digestive enzymes. Now also digestive enzymes. Uh, yes, we use them in our world to help digest food, but actually if they're taken on an empty stomach, they're very anti-inflammatory and there's great data out of Germany using, and there's very specific actually digestive enzymes, Wolf enzyme that there's a lot of clinical trials that were done on those as an anti-inflammatory for pain management, you know, mainly. So I love those to start with. And then some of these other herbal type stuff. So anything that exactly reduces inflammation. And, and unfortunately nowadays we're all swimming in a bath of toxins, as I call it. And so our, our systems are all upregulated and inflamed. And so things like curcumin and curcumin um, does interact with certain medicines. So as a disclaimer in the beginning, always double check with your clinician, with your healthcare provider, your doctors, and your pharmacist to make sure the medication regimens that you're on does not interact with these natural supplements, because a lot of times patients think, well, these are natural, they're not going to do anything or do anything with my meds. And I always tease and remind patients, I say, well, I say cyanide is natural too. And look what it does to you, <laughs> you know? So it's very important to make sure they're not interacting in obviously adverse ways. So curcumin, I love, as, as you said, Jill, it's, it's very um, anti-inflammatory. It really helps. A lot of clinical trials have been done with that one too. Um, you know, different pain syndromes, autoimmune disorders, and it can be very helpful. Uh, Boswellia, love, love, love. We use this one tons actually more in our migraine patients because absolutely in some patients, 
it tends to work very much better for them as like you said for you but also it penetrates the blood brain barrier a bit better so for migraines and other neuropathic type stuff i tend to like boswellia for those you know same reasons also oh, that's, that's so interesting because i did not realize and then there's one other thing with turmeric most people do amazing and it's even got anti-cancer benefits anti-inflammatory benefits but for some person, persons like myself who have a little bit of histamine issue, sometimes curcumin or turmeric can be a little bit histamine inducing for the mast cell patients. And then I find like you said, the Boswellia is a better alternative just for those subset, even though I would say 90% of people do really well in turmeric. Yeah. And like with the Boswellia, the five blocks in extract, like, you know, yeah. and also with supplements, as you guys know, you know, there's huge difference in quality out there, right? Yes. It's very important to get quality vetted professional line, you know, like the, uh, the Jills of the world and many other, you know, people to make sure that it's a good quality supplement that's well vetted and also pharmaceutical grade, because, um, there could be sometimes impurities that could be harmful, obviously to you, not helpful. And that's why sometimes I think it, you know, we see a lot of the European studies, they'll show great benefit. And then when we do the trials in the United States, they show no benefit. And I go, well, how can that be? And a lot of times it's really due to the quality of the supplement because our process here for supplement approval is very different. It's than very different, isn't the it? World. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned the German enzymes. So these are proteolytic enzymes and basically proteolytic enzymes have the ability to kind of, um, if someone has, you know, soft tissue, uh, lipomas or tumor growth or things, they, they tend to chew up um, some of that tissue and in the sense of, and they're very anti-inflammatory. So in the actual, actual vascular system, they're, I always think of like little Pac-Mans, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're actually chewing up enzymatically, just destroying some of those inflammatory molecules. So, and, and that would be really any, our favorite one, like you said, Robenzyme has some of the most um, data and it's from Germany, I believe, but there's lots of proteolytic enzymes that are good quality that are similar in nature. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And then, um, you know, the other one, obviously, you know, fish oil, as we always say, you know, you can Google any disease and you'll find a study with fish oil, you know, again, um, very anti-inflammatory. Now part of the fish oil, you know, is, uh, they can contain these SPMs or pre-resolving mediators. So right. I love SPMs. All I was time. totally going to mention, because that is my favorite. If you guys haven't heard of SPMs and now there's lots of manufacturers, one of the original was Metagenics SPM active, um, but there's lots and lots now. Um, um, Megaspore has a mega omega, which is fish oil plus SPMs. And I think Designs for Health has one. And I'm probably forgetting to mention some other companies, but do you know any of the other ones that might be out there that are real good quality? Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of those, um, like there's Oma Prim, I know, and then, um, uh, Omega XL is another great one, actually very high content of, uh, SPMs in them. And, um, you know, they're looking at that. So yeah, Omega XL is another one that I use, you know, Oma Prim is the professional line for mm -hmm. physicians with high SPM doses also. That's great. And um, SPMs actually act as an antiprostaglandin, which is one of the main pain pathways with both mast cells. So if you have mast cell activation and pain issues, or you just have pain from inflammation, um, that will be like the SPMs <clears throat> act as an antiprostaglandin. Is there any other mechanism that you know with SPMs? Yeah. So, I mean, what's really nice about SPMs, again, I love them because they're really root cause. That's why they're called resolving media. Right. They actually the root, so right? They're literally like they're not just band-aids. They really try to kind of go like, okay, what's off kilter, if you will, in the immune system, what's spewing all these angry hormones or these inflammatory mediators. And it tries to kind of level everything off. And that's why, you know, I really like them uh, because of that. Um, so that's, you know, another one that, that I love, you know, fish oils, SPMs, uh, curcumin. I love also quercetin, you know, you mentioned yeah. that, you know, gel with, because, you know, I always see that it's the forgotten side of the immune system. So a lot of times pain patients like especially patients with migraines, uh, patients that uh, have, you know, Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility syndromes, we tend to see mast cell activation syndrome very commonly in them. And obviously that could be caused either genetically from, you know, what's going on, whether it's mold, Lyme and other things that cause mast cell activation syndrome. And, and patients with post or post, uh, you know, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, we see this very commonly in them. What the crux of it in the root cause is really this mast cell activation. Yes. And so quercetin, which is what you get from onions and garlic and all this good stuff that we all should be eating lots of, but great trials in kind of lowering histamine. And I always say, 
it's these allergic, you know, allergic type patients, you know, the patients that come into you and go, oh, I can only eat, you know, chicken, yeah. rice and peas and that's it. Um, you know, really tune into mast cell activation and things like quercetin can be very helpful um, and also in pain because it's one of the inflammatory instigators of pain is another one. Methyl sulfonyl methane, I love um, it's yes. another one because uh, it's anti-inflammatory. CME, which what we call is the universal methylator. Oh, owner, love methyl it. Yeah, I love yeah. CME. And but CME, I, just a note, it's so interesting because you talked initially about antidepressants having some anti-pain effect. CME has been studied head to head is in front of some of the major antidepressants like Prozac and Paxil, et cetera. And actually at the 1200 milligram dose, it, it really beat out symptom improvement of almost all the major SSRIs. Yeah. So I love CME for energy, mood, and anti-inflammatory pain pathways. Yeah, actually in Europe, as you mentioned, it's it's one, it's the number one drug wow. depressant that's used. So it's approved in, in a lot of the European countries as a medication. And it's used, but great data in, in pain and stuff. But again, be careful, you know, start low and go slow yeah. because sometimes in your really toxic people and your slow methylators, or if they have that genetic SNPs where they're not mobilizing, you know, that wheel, if you will, sometimes they can start detoxing or over neuromethylating and you can really cause a lot of brain excitation. They get agitated, anxious, you know, or they feel horrible because now they start offloading all these toxins that they've been kind of bagging and storing, you know, for so years. that's an interesting thing because I want to mention a little pathway here. And again, some of our listeners are really savvy to this, but um, when you over methylate, you can, if you have an upregulated CBS enzymes, you might see that on your genetic detox pathways, you can produce metabolites that cause more pain. And I'll tell you one of my little secret weapons was I do have a fast CBS. And so on urinary organic acids, I would always have high cysteine and taurine. That was one of the ways that you could tell. And because those are metabolites of that pathway, but interestingly enough, that caused more stiffness and pain and molybdenum tends to detoxify um, that pathway if it's going too fast. So for me, molybdenum actually took away my pain and stiffness because of the CBS pathway. But that trace mineral molybdenum you would never think of as a first line for pain, right? Yeah. But you know, the pathway with the CBS, I, for me, it was kind of magical to take that and be like, oh, my stiffness is gone. Yep, exactly. And that's why, you know, personalized medicine, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, we've been practicing it forever, but now it's making yeah. splashes even in mainstream because it's exactly, it's all these little quirks that you find on genetics or epigenetics and things yes, like that. We can really yeah. mobilize the different pathways mm -hmm. and really, you know, help people. You know, the other one, like you mentioned with CBD. Yes, let's talk about uh, CBD because that's- <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so, you know, that's that's a whole, you know, another 50 hour topic right. per se, but, but definitely CBD, I call it, it's the master orchestrator, right? It's the orchestra right. conductor. So it kind of really sits on top of all your- brain chemicals, inflammatory pathways, and it really tries to modulate them. Um, and so I definitely, there is some, you know, good data on CBD modulating inflammation mm -hmm. um, without, you know, the THC associated sometimes central mm -hmm. effects that people don't like, yeah. you know, getting kind of dizzy, high, and, you know, and all these different things. So, and I'm not a huge fan of smoking, you know, just because of all the other additives, unfortunately, and toxins that patients will get. Uh, but I think CBD, a, cl a clean, organic CBD source uh, that's been well made, you know, with CO2 extraction. So again, the quality here is 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 paramount, is isn't it? Yeah, paramount. You know, because there's so much garbage out there and mm -hmm. dangerous. Some of it garbage. It's very important to look for people that really know what they're doing with CBD. Um, you know, it's organic because you know the marijuana plant requires a lot of pesticides and herbicides and things like that. So. You want to get organic because you don't want to be increasing your toxin burden that can just continue to increase inflammation and pain. So that's another one, um, you know, that, that I love to use. The other one that I love to use, which, you know, great data out of Europe, you know, is it's called PEEA -E 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 or palmitol ethanolamide, you know, that I love uh, for pain. It's, it's, it's kind of like, especially for neuropathy, sensitization you know, fibromyalgia, because as you know, this heightened pain perception, yeah. PEA, because it's kind of like a CBD and the boswellia and the quercetin and a ketotypin kind of stuck together all. And exactly. it really helps these different sensitization pathways and great data. Like I said, we have over 35, 40 clinical trials on it. So, you know, some of the supplement companies, I think Life Extension and some of the other ones now are beginning to add it. But 
I love that one too, that I use a lot, especially like with fibromyalgia, total body sensitivity syndromes. One other thing I just thought of as you're talking about fibro. So one of the reasons that sometimes that tissue tenderness, this is not like a, a muscle um, specific or a joint specific pain, but it's that tissues, um, which is kind of like our, um, you know, connective tissue areas, even with acupuncture, the, the areas that it addresses, and that can be from lactic acidosis. So one of the things that's very simple, very cheap to help with lactic acidosis is either alkaline water or mineral water, and also um, calcium or magnesium lactate, which comes as cheap as can be as a supplement. And sometimes if you have that pain in your tissues and you have lactic acidosis, those very, very simple things will help some of that um, pain. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, maybe let's, let's talk about fibromyalgia for like yeah. maybe a couple minutes, just because it's so common. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so, you know, a lot of times really fibromyalgia, it's either usually kind of an autoimmune disorder that has not been diagnosed, yeah. thyroid dysfunction. And so then the body is kind of working on fumes, I call right. it, right? that it's not getting the cellular energy, mm -hmm. or it's a mitochondropathy or mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's why they tend to hurt, as, as Jill said. So they're kind of like their cells are operating on fumes. They don't have real gasoline. So a lot of times, exactly, you know, magnesium, um, great clinical trials, you know, on magnesium helping. And I love magnesium for, you know, and, and I wanted to talk about it separately with fibro and just all pain syndromes. So, you know, when I told you kind of the, the brain gets sensitized in this brain inflammation, yeah. if you will, or hypersensitization. So there's these specific receptors called NMDA receptor and methyl d aspartate. So they're excitatory uh, mm -hmm. brain receptors, if you will, that propagate that signal. And actually magnesium is the gating ion that kind of shuts them down. And so magnesium is critical to put on board for any acute pain syndrome, mm -hmm. unless they have heart blocks and other couple contraindications or kidney disorders where we have to be really careful and not use them and things like that. But what it does is it really decreases the likelihood of an acute pain syndrome propagating into a chronic pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. So I love magnesium for fibro in any pain syndrome, lots of data on it in a variety, especially in migraines and fibro, um, you know, cellular energy things. So magnesium lactate, coenzyme Q10, D ribose, yes. um, you know, and, and then NAD, I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about, you know, uh, oh, NAD. my favorite. I want to hear about yeah. NAD. <laughs> so NAD, because, so, you know, also I always say patients in pain are basically AMP 24 seven. So cellular energy wise, they're very deficient because remember the pain, their body is going, you hurt, you hurt, something is wrong. And literally when something is going on like that in the body, just physiologically, your whole system is amped, right? Yeah. So it's in it's in fight mode. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to be very deficient in cellular energy. And so a lot of times you'll be amazed when we give pain patients cellular energy with CoQ10 and acetyl L-carnitine, you know, which are supplements and um and, and uh, D ribose and NAD, which I love, you know, you could use it, you know, like as a patch, some some providers are providing obviously as IV type mm -hmm. infusions and more and more data being collecting on it for opioid addiction and other types of addiction, you know, for detox, but for cellular energy, I love NAD. We have a whole chapter on that, you know, in the book, um, you know, low dose naltrexone, you know, we, uh, you know, I love that. <laughs> I always tease, we should put that in the water because everybody yeah. has immune dysregulation now, unfortunately. And low dose naltrexone, which is a medication that was approved long time ago for opioid and alcohol, you know, addiction, but low dose is very different. What mm -hmm. low dose does is it really kind of re-regulates what's dysfunctional in the immune system and really brings it uh, to balance. And there's a lot of data on low dose naltrexone also in a variety of different pain, autoimmune, you know, type syndromes, chronic pain syndromes, where it can be very helpful as an additional tool. Also fibromyalgia, because really we also think fibro really more and more we're finding out it's probably a small fiber nerve neuropathy or small fiber neuropathy and um you know all these other approaches that we've been talking about with fibro like gut rehab and fixing you know the inflammation and thyroid disorder and autoimmune type stuff and helping their cellular energy and their gut rehab you know the other tool that i use with uh you know fibro patients because you know if you come in and they go well i want you to eat you know um 
paleo, organic, all clean, cook, you know, three clean meals a day. I want you to exercise an hour a day, you know, and all that stuff. And they look at you like you're nuts because they can right. barely move and they hurt so bad. So one simple thing, in addition to these tools that we just gave you guys is go just in warm water pools. And I always tell patients to do that. I said, just go in a warm water pool. Don't move. I don't want you to even do anything. And you'll be amazed because it's even just the water pressure on the cells will actually push the lactic acid out and they just feel so much better from not even exercising. Like I know, because usually go, oh, I can do that. I'll go in and not move. And then when they feel a little better, I go, okay, well, how about you just move your arms just a little bit, you know, and legs a little bit, because we just need to get the lactic acidosis, like you said, out of their cells. And then they feel much better. And then we can ask them to do all these other you know, good things that we want them to do. But initially I see a lot of my colleagues do that and and they they just turn them off because they they feel horrible and they're very painful. Warm water is just amazing for, or like if they can take, um, I call them detox baths, but you know, warm water where they can put a little bit of Epsom salt yeah. You know, baking soda. I am a huge fan of Epsom salt baths. I recommend them all the time because me yes. first every single night, that's part of my nighttime ritual. And I'll recommend, you know, the Costco six pound bags or wherever you get them. Um, I'll use a half a bag per bath. That, I mean, you saturate that water because when you saturate the water, that gradient will actually drive the magnesium sulfate into your skin and tissues a little bit more than you would if you didn't have that water saturated. And then the essential oils you can blend in there with, you know, lavender or eucalyptus. It makes a wonderful, not only stress reduction, sleep inducer for insomnia and pain management all in one. <laughs> exactly. It's like one of the best brain, you know, brain calming, yes. you know, uh, supplements, you know, trace mineral that we have, you know, even when you have people that are having, you know, sleep, mm-hmm. you know, they can't sleep. That's the first yeah. thing I recommend because it's just so brain calming. And mm-hmm. I love lavender. I kind of choose lavender more than the other ones, mainly yeah. because it is so calming. I mean, they've done studies on lavender essential right. they're causing that theta wave, you know, in the mm-hmm. brain and right. causing that deep calm, you know, if you will. Um, so, you know, o- you know, oxytocin is another one, right? The love hormone for yes. sex, and that's another one that's kind of making. And you can get, as you know, with the compounding with your physician, you can get it compounded into a nasal spray or a lozenger. If you take it orally, it will not withstand the stomach. So you need to take it alternatively, either um, transdermal, sublingual, or as a nasal spray. But it does tend to be very powerful. What I found with oxytocin too is it can help to regulate ADH dysfunction in mold patients who have uh, trouble with regulating their hair hydration. Yep. Yeah. You know, that's another one that's really making splashes and, and it, it's kind of rebooting, I call it. So, you know, when you have your reptile and the reptile brain part of your brain or the reptile, you know, part, which is the limbic system. And this is what we call quote unquote, the pain experience, right? Cause mm-hmm. we have patients that go, you know, my pain is really bad, but we don't see the physiological right. sign. And so sometimes it's really what we call this wind up and wind down phenomena of pain and the hypothalamus thalamic systems where oxytocin works in the limbic system are very involved. So it's kind of that, that system that gets activated. Like when you are embarrassed, you flush, right? So it's an emotion that's translated into a physiological function. So kind of the same thing, the limbic system gets involved in the pain experience or processing and sometimes oxytocin and pain people is very helpful in kind of something related that. back to the serotonin pathway. It tends to be a adjuvant to um, serotonin as well. Um, yeah. Let's just our last few minutes. I can't believe this is, we could talk for hours. <laughs> this is such a great topic. We might have to have part two because yes, we're yeah. just like scratching the surface. But one thing I want to be sure and leave um, patients or listeners with uh, that we haven't talked about is things that other than supplements and herbs and nutrients, what, and we talked about Epsom salt baths, what other things have you found any sort of um, other therapies that are really powerful for pain? What would be like your top three alternative types of uh, other treatments that might be helpful for pain? Yeah. So, you know, absolutely. Acupuncture, right? We have a lot of data on acupuncture and, and we use that a lot, you know, physical therapy, myofascial release, mm-hmm. you know, those types of things, craniosacral, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I love, you know, all of those type, you know, services. You know, so absolutely additional type tools, you know, with and I just want to comment real quick on cranial sacral because I found most of my patients, I see a lot of environmental toxicity, Lyme disease, mold toxicity, and their limbic system is upregulated all, all across the board. hundred percent of them have a limbic activation, which is the fight or flight. 
and that definitely, if there's pain underneath will make the pain worse. So I love cranial sacral for one of the ways for limbic retraining. So basically calming that limbic system and it's a passive therapy versus going online and doing a course, which I think are, it could be great too. But I love cranial sacral for the sense of someone can actually receive the treatment versus going out and doing one more thing. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. I love that. You know, just anything that activates also, you know, like meditation, you know, mm -hmm. we want to turn up that parasympathetic yeah. response, especially in pain, in anything, but in pain patients, because they're so parasympathetically driven, mm -hmm. like they're in the fight mode all the time. Yes. So yes. Like, um, you know, I love anything, meditation, nature, calming, prayer, you know, Chitang, whatever, whatever's your happy zone, I call it, find yeah. it and do it at least twice a day, because there's a lot of data showing how we can activate the parasympathetic system. And that also modulates the pain signal, you know, it's kind of the rest of that, you know, I system. So, you know, I love that we know stress reduction, definitely cortisol, you know, and, and adrenal dysregulation is very involved in pain and, and inflammation, mm -hmm. right? So definitely you know, so we think, you know, you know, physiological or psychological stress, whatever the brain, the body doesn't know, it just goes right. on stress, right? Right. So anything that modulates the adrenals, the, the, the inflammation, the stress response, because that sprouts inflammation, we know when we have adrenal dysfunction, yes. uh, that also we don't have as well of a breaks on the inflammatory pathways. And so definitely working on that system. So whatever your happy spots, you know, but adrenal uh, herbs, if patient, if people are listening to rhodiola is a great one, phosphatidyl serine, uh, phosphatidyl choline is another pathway, but that can be helpful too. And then magnolia or hornic coil is another one that I just love for modulating higher cortisol levels. Yes. You know, absolutely. And that's, what's nice about these adaptogens because if cortisol mm -hmm. is high, it lowers it. If it's low, it brings it up. And so it really kind of, it modulates into that happy zone along with you know, stress reduction, better sleep, you know, sleep yeah. is critical for pain management. So getting quality of sleep, you know, we're using more and more melatonin. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if you need it, if you don't need it, you don't need it because your body makes right. it. But we used to think melatonin was just kind of, oh, it just puts you to sleep. And now we're finding a lot more of its anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and immunomodulatory. Yeah, so many so, new, new, new studies coming out on melatonin and melatonin. So just, you know, sleep. So that the, all the good stuff that we all should be doing, you know, less stress, eating better, eating healthy, clean, anti-inflammatory diets, you know, acupuncture, craniosacral stress reduction, good sleep, lots of water, hydrate, hydrate in pain. You know, again, you know, sometimes, you know, we forget about that simple things We're made out of, you know, 75, 70, 80% water. Right. If you don't have good lubrication in your joints, you know, that's going to hurt. And so even just water and those, you know, typical things that we forget about, that's very important to remind all of us, including us clinicians, mm -hmm. you know, to do, and yes. also, you know, help remind our patients to do, you know, and a lot of times, you know, you really have to do this um, into, you know, a cohesive approach, because sometimes just one, you know, tool and one dart is not going to fix it. But a lot of times we get high success levels when we really integrate a lot of these different tools and kind of hit these different pathways. Um, you the know, things you want like a one size fits all. And as you heard already in this 45, 50 minutes, um, there are so many levels and layers and just like mass cell activation treatment or detoxification, there's usually no one pill that's going to do all the pathways. So it may take a little trial and error um, to get this. Um, we have just chock full this, this interview with information. Where can people find more about you and where can they get your book? Yeah, so absolutely. Good old Amazon, like everybody, right? So you can find the book on Amazon. My website specifically- And say the title again for people who didn't hear uh, it. The title of the book is Advanced Therapeutics and Pain Medicine. And um, my website specifically is sahar.world. So S-A-H-A-R dot world, W-O-R-L-D. And that's where you'll find, you know, a lot about me, the book, uh, the skincare line that I have, you know, again, I'm very passionate about clean living, you know, kind of like Jill. And, um, and so that was my other, you know, fun side project to make, you know, skin foods that kind of speak our language with clean living, if you will. With, Love uh, it. Because again, just like with anything, you don't want to be slapping you know, all these toxins on your body that you use every day and every day, you know, whether it's your cleaning products, your skincare products, your, uh, your uh, hygiene, you know, daily hygienic products and so on. So um, that's where you can find all about me and all the lectures that we always 
do myself and then Jill in our different circles. Yeah, so I will, I will link up here um, and below on YouTube, you will find those links. And like I said, I think we're gonna have to do part two because there's so many good questions in yeah. here and everybody's asking about more information. So I will be sure and direct them to your book. Um, was it written more for uh, patients or clinicians or both? Is there any- You know, really both, you know, both. Sure, sure. You know, there's some technical terms, just like now we will throw yeah. it up and then we explain it, yeah. you know? So absolutely, it's for clinicians and it's for, um, you know, our patients because we really wanted to provide, you know, for all to just learn these additional tools that can, are available to them to really help them in their healing and journey to wellness. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time this Friday. Look forward to catching up with you soon. And everybody listen, thank you and have a great day. We will be sure and uh, include all the links we mentioned uh, below. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You're welcome.